This video is going to serve for a guide for everything that you need to know for GAMSAT. It's part of a larger series that I'm doing at the moment that is for grad entry applicants where I'm going to be doing an entire playlist which you can check out here and I'm going to be adding a new video each week to give you a comprehensive guide for everything that you need to know about applying to graduate entry medicine in the UK. Here's everything that we're going to discuss about the GAMSAT today but by the end you should have a clear plan of when you should do it, how you should go about preparing and what you need to do to get a top score. For all the students that I coach to get into to graduate entry medicine, they find this exam the most grueling. It's intense, it's long, and also it combines scientific knowledge, humanities knowledge, all with essay writing. But what I'm hoping to show you by the end of this video is that if you prepare in the right way, it can make the whole entire thing much more manageable. So I'm not gonna spend too long on what the GAMSAT is, but I am gonna tell you some of the key details that you need to know because it's gonna help guide us as to what they're looking for and hence that's gonna influence how we prepare. It's called the Graduate Medical School Admissions Test founded by ASA, the Australian Council for Educational Research, and it got adopted in Europe and the UK by medical schools who wanted to take on graduate applicants with humanities degrees, but that they still wanted to check that they have the scientific capabilities to handle the fast-paced course of graduate entry medicine without penalising them for not having a science-based degree. So for this year, here are the universities that require the GAMSAT. Note that not all of them are GEM courses. Actually, some of them, although they're undergraduate, courses still require graduate applicants to do the GAMSAT in order to go onto their undergraduate course. Now one of the most important aspects of the GAMSAT and the cardinal sin that people make is thinking that it's a content-based exam so go away and learn loads of maths, biology, chemistry but it's not that at all. It's a psychometric cognitive test that encourages problem solving rather than pure science. What's important to know is that those universities do change year on year. Things have changed in COVID as well like the length of the exam has gone from six hours to 4.5 hours and that might change back after COVID we don't know. Also, there are only two sittings now in the year for the GAMSAT. They are March and September. Registration opens six months before. You have all the way up to about six weeks before when early bird registration closes. And then after that, you have about another 10 days until full registration closes exactly a month before the sitting window of the exam. You usually have about a two to three week sitting window within which you can sit it, like I say, in March or in September. The cost of the exam is £268 and you get, if you book in that kind of 10 day period of the late registration, you have an additional £60 to pay on top of that. So as I said, COVID did change things recently, but what I'm about to tell you is going to affect how you prepare and ultimately how you get the best score. One of the important things to note is that you have two years within which to sit your GAMSAT score. So the score counts for two years ahead. So let's say, for example, if you're going to apply in September 2023, you can sit the GAMSAT either September 2023, March 2023, September 2022, or March 2022. So that gives you four attempts to essentially get the highest score that you need. What's really good about the GAMSAT is that they take your highest score. So effectively you get four attempts at it to get the score that you need. And we'll talk about scores later and what you need to get into the competitive GEM application spots. My suggestion is that in a perfect world, I would recommend that you try and sit the March sitting. That's for a few reasons. The first being that if you sit it in March and you don't do as well as you expected, you've always got the September sitting, no matter what year you're applying, whether it's that year or the year after, to at least have another go at getting the score you need. But also, it's more about where it fits in the application cycle. In March, you have the minimum amount of things going on. It's the least busy time of that application cycle. If you were to do the September sitting, you've got your UCAT around that time. And even if you did it early in the UCAT window, then you still don't have that much time to prepare and kind of do all the necessary preparation that you need to score highly. Also, you have so much other stuff going on around that time. You've got your personal statement to write. You've got the decision to make about which universities you're going to apply to. You've got to submit your UCAS application and there's all just a lot going on. Also, if you're sitting it in September and you have your application submitted, you don't get your results until two months after. So in March, you get your results in May and in September, you'll get your results in November. So effectively, if you submit it not knowing your score, you're applying blind to those universities and you have less control Control and you can be less tactical. Whereas, for example, if you know you've got a good score and you have a good chance of getting in with your GAMSAT score to a specific university, you can apply with confidence. Whereas, if you have your UCAT score, which you will have at that point, and you're thinking, mm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'm going to get a good score on the GAMSAT, then you're effectively 
being less strategic, or maybe wasting a, a place of those four application spots that you've got when you're applying blind effectively. So everything I do about coaching the students on my elite coaching program is giving you the best possible chances of success. And that's always planning for a plan B just in case we don't get the result that we wanted. The final quick thing to note is that you do have to go to the location and there are locations throughout the UK, Australia and all throughout the world if you need to sit them. Let's start by looking at each section, how it's laid out and how it is scored. Section one is an MCQ format with 62 questions in total. The section is titled Reasoning in Humanities and you'll be expected to read information from various sources and answer questions based around it. Section two is an essay format with two questions in total. This section is titled Written Communication and asks candidates to write two short essays in response to comments on two themes. Section three is an MCQ based one again with 75 questions in total. This section is titled Reasoning in Biological and Physical Sciences and requires candidates to read sources based in chemistry, biology and maths and answer questions combining the sources with their own knowledge. So the GAMSAT scoring is actually a bit of a mystery. It's not a percentage as people think or a score out of a certain number. It's actually done by taking each section, scoring it separately, adding the scores together and then taking section three and doubling the score, then dividing that entire number by four to give you an average and a score for each section. So different GEM courses have different requirements which I'll put on the screen now. Typically it's an average of so and so and then they'll have a particular section maybe that needs to be higher than a certain score. Universities can do anything from having a minimum average score, they could have a average score plus no lower in any one section than a certain number or they might also say a certain section is more valued so they want to see a certain score in that given section. One thing to be aware of is that although universities might have a genuine cutoff score of say 50, there's still the competitive element of it. Remember that GEM is one of the most competitive sub-branches of one of the most competitive courses to apply to. So even if you might get the 50, there might be loads of people with an average score of 57 or kind of the high 50s. So just be aware that even though you make the technical cutoff, it might not be enough to be invited to interview just because the average of everybody else is so high. So although scores matter and it's good to have an idea of what you're aiming for, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You should really just be focusing on getting the highest score possible to make sure that you guarantee your chances of getting in. And if you want to find out how you can get that high score, I recommend you check out this video here where we show how we teach our students to get the highest GAMSAT score they can. ACER actually take that score and moderate it within the cohort, but they also moderate that cohort against the two previous years of cohorts to make sure that if that was a particularly difficult exam, it doesn't put you at a disadvantage to get compared to previous years. That's why your score is valid for two years so that it can carry forward for one or maybe even two application cycles. So for how to prepare, I'm actually gonna read you some sage advice from my head GAMSAT tutor, Charlie, who is the best at preparing the students to prepare to get a high score. If you're a humanities student, start with section one and two preparation to create a baseline for yourself, as this is likely where your skills are before moving on to section three preparation. The opposite is true for the science students, beginning with S3 before moving on to focus on S1 and two. With concerted effort, eight hours or more a week, three months should be sufficient to prepare to give the exam your best shot. However, if you're doing less each week, a couple of hours, maybe you might need more like six months to prepare. It really depends on how much time you're putting in each week and how long you have to prepare for that exam. Each section is different and needs to be tackled in a slightly different way. The soundest advice for each section is to try one of the ACER past papers, such as blue or orange first, to see what kind of questions there are coming up. Your score for this run through isn't relevant, but it will show you the type of knowledge you need to acquire and will help tailor your revision. So for section one, the best way to prepare is by first doing an ACER past paper. That will just get your eye in. Then after that, note down any terms that you're unfamiliar with so that you can keep a record somewhere of all the phrases that you're accumulating. Carry on doing past paper or practice questions until you get about 70 to 75% correct untimed. Make sure that you're checking on your answers, whether they're right or whether they're wrong, because you want to know the logic behind why you got it wrong, but also the logic behind why you got it right as well. Then. Once you go on to time questions, just prepare that you will get a score drop. That's natural as soon as people move on to time questions, but just persist with it. And then as you see over time, you can start with a slower time and then just gradually work your way towards the ACER actual time. But you'll see that slowly over time, you will improve and your scores will progress. For section two, again, I recommend that you start by attempting an ACER past paper. Then 
read around the subjects because this is the more humanities one. So understand some key concepts in politics, history, philosophy, sociology, just important subjects that are going to keep you aware and just know general themes that are important. In fact, there's a really fantastic book that I've put in the description below that I'd highly recommend you buy just to kind of in one fell swoop, in one book to give you all the knowledge that you need that's going to set you straight for this section. Then what you want to do is practice planning your answers quickly and thoroughly. There will be a kind of overlapping range of topics. So what I'd recommend is that you keep an information bank of all key quotes that you want to use and that you feel that you could use across multiple areas and have them rehearsed and ready to kind of have at hand because if you have quite a few good ones, then you'll just have them ready to go and you can probably apply one of them to almost any situation that will come up. My big tip is to never spend more than one hour completing an essay and then gradually over time, dial down your time so that you're doing an essay in 30 minutes. And then finally, section three, the sciencey one. No prizes for guessing the first point. It is to do an ASA pass paper to get your eye in again. Take note of any subjects that come up and just keep a list of the ones that have come up so that you make sure that you know a little bit about each. Then one of the most important things, and as I say, a common mistake, is trying to learn all the intricate details of all the science. Just make sure that you have a grounding and understanding in the core concepts and principles. And that will set you really apart to work from a fundamental ground level knowledge up, and then you can work things out from there. Rather than trying to learn all the intricate details of amino acids or whatever it is, just understand the basic concepts the building blocks of an atom, a molecule, and what all that sort of stuff is. Another thing I'd recommend is to keep a bank of common equations that you need to memorize just somewhere at hand. Also, don't forget your maths, that's really important as well. And then again, start with practicing questions untimed, get to that 70, 75% before starting at a reasonable time and then slowly dial it down to the required time specific to the exam. One of the most common questions I get is about what resources to use. So I've done a blog article that was written by my GAMSAT tutor, which which is linked in the description below, so you can check that out. Other things I'd say are the ASA past papers. So they actually charge you 30 pounds for each one to do that, but it is worth it because it's kind of giving you an idea of exactly what's gonna come up, and you can sense some patterns there, and that's really gonna help you best prepare and be the most effective. Otherwise, one of the best resources that we have is our elite coaching program, where we do an intensive GAMSAT one-on-one -on -one coaching as well as group teaching, just to make sure people are really well trained to be prepared as best they can to score highly. And also with the GAMSAT, don't be too disheartened if you feel like you have to do a resit. It's very common for people to resit and get a much better score second time around after they've worked out what the exam's about than they do the first time. The GAMSAT is one of many aspects of the graduate application. And there's a lot that you need to know and make sure that you get right to just make sure that you get into such a competitive part of medicine applications. So I've made a playlist here that talks through every aspect of it and all the important things that you need to know to make sure you maximize your chance of getting it. So I look forward to seeing you over in that playlist there, which is going to give you everything that you need to know. And thanks for watching.